Yep. Um, what second hire, I think, actually, uh, for data science. Uh, and you worked at Uber for five? Six. Six years. Plus. Um, and uh, he's now working at this group called Talent. And uh, one more thing, if you're in my class, got to do this, sign in. This is the URL. That's the code. This is how I know you're here and you get credit for attending. Uh, otherwise, I'm not going to take up any more time. Thanks, Kevin. Give him a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was pretty actually wild. I wish I had the power to just command a room of like 450 people to applaud me. Um, <laughs> that was pretty great. Um, yeah, so like Brad mentioned, my name's Kevin Novak. Uh, I've been working with Brad professionally in the Uber sense and sort of spiritually in the sense of developing data science now for the better part of six, seven years. Um, and so of course what Brad told me, hey, you got to come down, meet my class. It's 450 people. I couldn't possibly turn this down. Um, topic here, a little loose, a little informal. Um, I didn't want to do some things super quantitatively rigorous. I didn't quite know exactly where you're at. Um, and so Brad said, everybody wants to know, how did you get into data science? And like, what are you doing in your day-to-day -day job right now? So that's basically what uh, this talk is about. Before I get into it, AV situation, okay, could you hear me? Is there any like weird echoes? Perfect, okay. So I'm a big believer in the like, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told them style of presenting. So here's my agenda. Um, I'm gonna do this in sort of reverse chronological order. So first thing, just talk through Tala, what I'm up to now. And I want to give you the like high level mission statement view of the company just so you kind of understand the business. Um, secondly, dig a little bit into some of the key data science problems which we're really digging into at this moment. Um, and then just sort of give you like a case study of a challenge you're going to run to, into in everyday life. Just going a little bit deeper into one specific. Um, once we do all of that, um, step back and just sort of talk about how I got into data science. I've been doing this professionally for almost eight years now. Um, came up in a time when there wasn't such a blessing as a data science major or a data science classic and taking the course, um, and ended up doing startups and having a lot of fun with it. So just sort of talk through my progression out of academia into the industry field. Um, and then I want to do Q&A. That usually is like where most of the fun happens. Um, I didn't actually think through how we're going to do Q&A with 450 people. Do you have any recommendations, Dr. Wojtek? We'll wing, we'll wing it. Okay, outstanding. <laughs> Speak loudly. Okay, let's get into it. So Tala, what it, who here, by the way, just like show of hands, who here has heard of Tala? A couple? Okay. So I'm, we're going to do a longitudinal experiment. Remember this moment, because I'm going to come back next year or the year after, and we're just going to measure how many hands go up every year. That tells me if I'm doing a good job or not. Um, what is Tala? We'll start there. I'll get 450 people on board with our mission. Um, we are a microcredit company, the, sort of an offshoot of this idea of microfinance. So fundamentally what the idea is is using nothing but the information on your smartphone. We can make a decision about whether or not you're credit worthy and are able to repay a load, usually in the scope of about $30 to $50 US equivalent. Um, why is this useful? We've actually developed a sort of business plan which enables us to go into emerging markets, East Africa, Southeast Asia, India, Mexico, really interesting, um, and deploy a system which is like hyper-optimized for getting people who have never had a bank account, had never had a credit line before, and get them access to ethical credit. And what I mean by that is it's very common in these parts of the world, some of you might be familiar with this, to have something which is like akin to like a payday lender or you know, a, you know somebody who's giving you like, you know, the VIG is 30% a week and if you don't pay, I'll break your kneecaps, right? Like this is a much more traditional approach to Here's a load, we have an upfront fee but no carried interest. Uh, and when you can pay it back to us, you know, we're gonna start building a system to, to sort of change your behavior, trade your behavior to building an awesome financial system. With me so far, a couple nods, you've got them well trained, excellent. 
Of course, I'm an executive at a company, so I have to start with a mission statement. Um, Tala's mission statement is unlocking financial access, choice, and control for underserved people globally, one financial identity at a time. That's just like a very highfalutin way and a much more concise way of just giving you the rundown I just gave you. Um, let's see. Covered most of this. I, built, I kind of built this deck so that like, we could take this, you guys could look at it offline. So there's gonna be a lot of text that I just kind of like talk over. Um, you know, pay attention to me, not the words too much, but if you get lost or want to review, most of what I say is in the text. Um, one of the big things to think about are, are expansion plans. You start with this sort of micro credit product. How can I make consistently good decisions about credit worthiness, uh, about people's ability and willingness to repay, but you want to really expand it to not just credit, but also giving people savings, basically a place where they could store, save, and build their money when they're not, so you're just sort of borrowing on, on margin. Um, and finally, insurance. Basically, how do we create a situation where these sort of once in a lifetime or you know, once in a decade events which have uh, a pretty significant uh, financial implication for people. How do we create products to just help people prepare and sort of mitigate for that? If you can do credit, savings, and insurance, you're well on your way to sort of being able to use financial services like a pro. You got me? So, I mentioned most of our customers right now focused in East Africa. So these are actually some of like our first five customers. Oh, it came out surprisingly well. We're, I'm sort of workshopping this image just because you know, like low focus, it's not super great to see. But um, our biggest market by far is Kenya. Fun fact, we're actually, Tala is actually the third most popular app in Kenya. So it goes WhatsApp, Facebook, Tala. So Mark Zuckerberg, I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, we've expanded into Tanzania, we're looking into Uganda, but basically like that part of Africa um, has been really excellent for Tala for a couple uh, of fairly straightforward reasons. One, the mobile payments ecosystem is incredibly well developed in East Africa. The idea of like paying for your cell phone or paying for your groceries using your phone is like not a foreign concept. Um, in many ways, they're actually, I think, ahead of, of the United States in this regard. Secondly, smartphone penetration is off the charts. I mean, I'm not sure how much you guys have seen about this data, but smartphones are like coming to the developing world in a really big way, and it really came to Africa through Kenya. Smartphones are excellent. They're the data scientist's best friend because they're like one of the coolest, most high fidelity, most globally accessible pieces of data acquisition equipment that you can leverage as part of your careers. Uh, obviously, there's like a uh, technology layer you have to build on top of that, but smartphones are an entire prerequisite for Tala. They were a prerequisite for Uber. I think they're a prerequisite in many ways for a lot of the future data science products. We could talk more about that later. Okay. Just a quick snapshot of the product. So basically it's an app you download on your phone, sign up, punch in a, bu a bunch of information. We've clocked people. It takes you about three minutes to punch everything in. Um, and then in about three more minutes, we can come back to you with a credit decision. Congratulations, you qualified for you know, a thousand shilling loan, a 5,000 shilling loan. Um, so the idea here is like relatively easy to apply, incredibly quick to get a decision. You know, the idea is like, you know, you're walking to the market, you wanna buy your groceries to pay to organize your food stand this week. Like by the time you get to the market after having led home, you will have received your loan. Make sense? Okay. Now, that's the business, right? But we're data scientists. Let's talk about the data science problem, right? Three big ones we're really focused on right now. One is smartphones, as I said, are incredibly wonderful data collection devices, but they're not very good identity verification devices, right? You could absolutely pick up somebody else's phone uh, and apply for a loan pretending you're them. You could use your own phone and use somebody else's information. Congratulations, I'm Brad Wojtek. I'd like a million dollar loan, please, thanks. Um, so there's sort of just a fundamental identity problem. How do we make sure that the identity information that's being enter entered into our credit application is valid, right? Second problem, the loan default problem. What happens if you get a loan and you don't pay it back? I wish I could hire 
knee breakers. Actually, I don't. I'm kidding. But, but you sort of have this problem of like, hey, what happened, right? Um, when you are interacting with your users through a smartphone interface, that presents a unique challenge, right? And finally, there's the credit score problem, right? That as people exhibit a pattern of creditworthy behavior, right, how do we, one, track that? Two, how do we use that to make better credit decisions? Congratulations, you qualify for a bigger loan, say. And third, how do we like communicate that information to other folks, right? How do we build like a technologically scalable way of saying, like Kevin's been paying back loans successfully for the last six months. He's one of our best customers. He absolutely deserves a loan to take to you know, a you know, five thousand dollar loan to uh, open a new restaurant or something like that. There's just this like sort of basic idea of like how do we quantify somebody's credit worthiness in a world where like FICO doesn't exist. Okay. See, I got memes. I'm hip. <laughs> okay. So. I'm going to go deeper into that identity problem. Remember, right, we have this problem of how do we, we kind of, if you're not thoughtful about it, it's very easy to not understand who the identity or who the person is and whether the person who is standing in front of the smartphone is the same person whose identity is being entered in a load application. So we kind of have to solve that problem. And we have to do it at a distance because we're data scientists and we're sort of working at the level of data. <laughs> Thankfully, we're have a business operation uh, that can help sort of augment that process. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So first, one of the easiest things for us to get signal on, right? Think about this like a data set where you've got sort of transactional information on one side and the label on the other side. A loan was not repaid. The label was not paid, right? What's possibly going on? So you have a couple opportunities, right? Somebody wasn't able to repay their loan, and they say, you know what? I had a crazy week, I had a crazy month, I'm a little bit behind, I'll make it up to you next week, right? This is a situation where we'd like to know it, but this is not an emergency, right? Life happens, things get in the way, it's the reason it's called a credit line, and you're allowed to sort of you know, carry this balance over time. But it'd be nice to know if we were absolutely sure whether somebody was gonna repay in the near future. Second possible situation, right? Somebody says, you know what? I just can't afford to repay this loan. I thought I could, you know, like, like life was organized in such a way that, you know, I make 100 bucks a month, a $50 loan isn't a big deal. And truthfully, they don't actually have the ability to repay. Life is in their way, their bills are too high, what have you. Customer wants to repay, but doesn't have the ability to repay. What's interesting about this situation is it's actually me not doing my job, right? Part of my job when it comes to qualifying somebody for a loan in an ethical way is being able to mitigate this problem, right? You kind of have to be able to predict it and assess people's ability to repay, not just their sort of intent. Third possible situation. Customer doesn't intend to pay because they never intended to pay. Congratulations, Tali gives out $50 loads. That means I just got 50 free dollars. Moving on with my life, right? Delete the app, hand your phone off to somebody else, right? Happens all the time. Fourth possible situation, customer doesn't intend to pay because the person on the credit application was not themselves, right? Brad took out the million dollar loan, not me, but I got the million bucks, right? This is the situation you have to pay attention to. This is why I figured out the identity problem matters. But the problem gets even more interesting, right? So think about the other side of the equation. The loan was repaid. Congratulations. Possible situation. Customer intended to pay because they were ready, willing, and able to pay. Take out a $50 loan, pay back 50 bucks next week. Life is good, right? But there's an interesting side effect. Customer paid because they used a fake ID and they plan to defraud us once the loan amount increases, right? I want a million bucks off of Tala, so I'm gonna pretend I'm Brad, get $500 loan, repay that, get a $1,000 loan, repay that, keep doing that till I get a million bucks, and then disappear off into the sunset, right? So you actually see a pattern of repayment sometimes with a fraudulent identity. So, the identity problem, why, why I pick up on this 
is I think it highlights probably one of the most classic situations you're ever going to run into in real world data science when you sort of step outside the textbook, which is the thing you see, as in the thing which, for which it is incredibly easy to get labels for, is not actually all that informative. Oop. Oh no. It's not actually all that informative because the two cases you want are actually in both sides of your labeled data set. Does that make sense? So how do you actually solve this in the real world? This is what we're going through as a problem solving process. Um, and sort of just gives you a taste of sort of how this works, right? We go back to this world and we say, Okay, a loan was not repaid. I, I can't share exact numbers, it's a little, but you can assume that the bolded category above is significantly more common than the bolded category below. The, the one above is actually considered sort of high frequency, low exposure. You know, like it happens more often, but you know, we tend to lose $50 at a time. The one below is low frequency, but high exposure. You know, it happens once a year, but the order of magnitude loss is significantly bigger. So when it comes to building a data set, you always go for the high velocity problem. So we actually have an investigative team. So you take this labeled data set and you say, okay, let's pull a random subsample of people who didn't pay their loans and just call them up. Say, hey, what's going on? You know, sometimes you can do it as a third party because there's sort of a, um, I forget the exact term, but essentially people are embarrassed to admit that they wouldn't be able to repay a loan, right? So call them up and sort of say, hey, what's going on? Usually if they don't pick up the phone, you sort of have to repeat it. You can sort of pretty safely conclude that this was sort of fraudulent behavior at sublevel. Um, so use that to start to actually fill in the true labels on your data set. Right? Your team can come back and say, not only did they not pay, but after investigation, we couldn't validate their identity. You start to build a higher fidelity data set using nothing but good old fashioned human sweat and ingenuity. Second process, once you have that sort of refined data set, again, smartphones are your friends. So Tala collects a ton of information off of your phones. Oftentimes, this is for both the purposes of assessing your credit worthiness, but also for the purposes of assessing whether or not you are actually the person you say you are, right? Social networks are incredibly informative about this. Um, your text messages, believe it or not, are incredibly affordable. We do not read your text messages, but there is an interesting fun fact, right? The number of languages you speak is in the top 10 most informative features about how likely you are to repay a loan. And it's actually inversely correlated. So the more languages you speak, the data is showing us that the customers we have, to be precise, the customers we have who are more multilingual have a higher default rate. They're less likely to pay uh, loads back. Which is interesting, right? Because you think this is one of the interesting situations of having a customer base, which is sort of eight time zones away, three cultures away from, from you, right? You think in the United States, in Western culture, sort of rough rule of thumb, how multilingual you are roughly correlates with how much education you have, which roughly correlates with sort of your socioeconomic situation. In emerging markets, it's actually, we hypothesize it's actually different, that being multilingual is indicative of people who, for example, um, exhibit more migratory behavior. You have to sort of move to different parts of the country for work. So it actually could be indicative of less financial security than more financial security. Um, so that's sort of like an interesting data point on, on credit worthiness. The other thing we tend to look at mostly when it comes to fraudulent identities is you just sort of like look at people's app install behavior, right? Nobody in the normal course of life installs like 85 apps in a row, right? Just like big, 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 big. And so you can actually look at people's sort of behavioral patterns. How are you using your phone? Or did you send 5,000 text messages at a rate of like one every 10 seconds? Well, you guys are college students. You might actually send text messages at a rate of one every 10 seconds. But in the normal course of life, that's a highly unlikely event. It could be indicative of somebody, say, filling a phone with fake data to, to apply for a loan, right? So those sort of behavioral signals, which you could parse off of a phone, or respecting the sort of anonymity of the content of any one advice, are actually incredibly informative in detecting fraudulent behavior. And finally, augment it with third-party data. So um, 
For example, there are companies which um, can map uh, IP addresses to physical addresses. There are companies which, there's a, one that's actually incredibly common, you guys will probably be using it, some of you will in your capstone course, that's called email age. So I could tell you basically, if somebody provides you an email, how long ago was that email created? Right? What was the first time that, that somebody sent an email using that address? Rule of thumb is, is if you just invented your email to apply for a load, that's a bad side. Right? You want sort of a pattern of behavior. Um, other good third-party data, um, there's a company called SafeGraph, which uh, collects and sells location information. So if you have ever had an app on your phone to which you have given permission for it to always track your location, I can almost guarantee that that's been sold to a third-party vendor. Right? That there's some, <laughs> it's true. And so that somebody has, they don't know who you are, but they know your device ID, A, B, C, D, P, D, Q, one, two, three, four, you know, hangs out at UC San Diego. So you might want to check your permissions. Well, actually, don't check your permissions if you want to load, but <laughs> I'm teasing. <coughs> cool. All right. Now, <coughs> sorry. Um, so once you've sort of gone through this process, you use human beings and ingenuity to refine your easily observable la labels to more hard to achieve but higher fidelity labels, augment um, those labels with signals from your smartphones and then fold in third party data. The problem in the professional sense is essentially solved, right? The, what you guys are spending the next three, four years of your lives learning, practicing, refining, basically takes over from this point. Once you have a high quality labeled data set with a high degree of features, essentially the rest is plug and chug, right? So using this, we can do things like user segmentation. We can do a straightforward regression model just to like calculate the probability between zero and one that this is a fraudulent identity. Um, you could do categorization, high risk, medium risk, low risk. As it essentially, um, the rest of this process is just a question of basically how do you want me to explain how risky this person is? Um, and so for that reason, as the professors like to say, it's left as an exercise left to the reader. <laughs> okay. My story. How did I get here today? I actually took an Uber down from Los Angeles today. So even though I'm now at Tala, still got to still got to rep the brand, right? Um, my career in data science. So um, came up. So I actually I played collegiate football. I actually played high school football. I was like a football nut, right? Like I mean, look at me. Like I was not built to go and like run cross country. Um, and uh, I, I went to Xavier University, which is ranked sixth in the country right now in college basketball. Um, and then went on to Michigan State, which is ranked like second in the country in college basketball. So now I'm like a basketball sort of football hybrid person. But at both schools, I was always really interested in this sort of problem of the abstract sort of quantitative world intersecting the real world, right? Like I remember AP Physics senior year, our final exam was you had like a little air cannon and you would measure the velocity that came out of this cannon, and then the professor or the teacher at the time would put the cannon somewhere in the room, right? He'd like put on like the seventh step, and your final exam was like you got a piece of paper that was about the size of a silver dollar, and you just kind of had to like plunk it down, right? And then if the ball hit your ball bearing, congratulations, you got the A. If you came within like six inches, it was a B, whatever. And I remember in that moment falling in love with physics and falling in love with, is that, with what has now become data science, that you can like, it blew my mind that you can like solve this like hyper abstract numerical problem over here on the whiteboard and predict, modify, and optimize behavior of the real world. Like that linkage is super cool to me, right? So I studied physics, math, and then computer science because I realized pretty quickly that the coolest problems are not actually expressed in like silver dollar pieces of paper, but they're expressed in numeric programming, right? Computers are the interface by which the quantitative world intersects the physical world. And so I just like 
got obsessed with that interface. What that actually meant is I'm actually a really bad physicist. You know, like in physics, it's like very uncool to just do programming. You have to do like radiation or lasers or, um, but the best thing about being good at physics and computer programming is when you go to grad school, you get like unrestricted access to supercomputers. So went to Michigan State, majored in nuclear physics because they had the most supercomputer time. It was very interesting. I like backed into Michigan State nuclear physics is like ranked number one in the country because there's a particle accelerator on campus. And I like never studied nuclear physics, but I backed into this super prestigious program because I knew how to program. So like all of you take CS, you'll never know how useful it'll be. Um, did a lot of work in my PhD thesis on the Higgs boson, which was cool. I get to brag about it now. The downside is it was discovered about two and a half years before I finished my PhD. And for those of you not familiar or about to go to career in academia, that means I ran out of money about two and a half years before I finished my PhD. So I did the classic entrepreneurial pivot, walked around the campus, tried to find a home for my research. Thankfully, we were able to sort of shim it to fit into some meteorology grants and some galaxy formation grants. Those of you in research are sort of like nodding in agreement, like you, this sounds like a very sympathetic story. But they didn't want to do galaxy formation or meteorology. So in the, in the entrepreneurial parlance, I seeked an exit, right? And um, my roommate from undergraduate uh, college, was the seventh employee at Uber and said, listen, there's this crazy limo company. It has an app. They need somebody who's good at math and programming. Again, math and programming. Come check us out, right? And uh, so I joined Uber in July 2011. Um, Brad was actually already working at Uber at the time. I'm not sure if he's told you those war stories. If not, you now know. Um, and spent the next six years of my life building um, the world at least a system aspiring to be the world's most effective transportation system. Um, early on, I kinda, it was like kind of the dream job. Basically, every aspect of Uber, which had some sort of numeric programming, data science bent to it, but went into our product, was something I got to touch. So Uber's ETA engine, basically like, your car is five minutes away. Um, how do we get that number and why data science problem? Processing GPS points and then using that to calculate your fare, data science problem. Um, the big thing I spent like two years building was Uber's dynamic pricing system. So if you've ever been surged in an Uber, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was a lot of fun, not just because it was a really cool data problem and sort of market optimization problem, but it really forces you to think about the product aspect, right? So I used to have a slide, I can maybe dig them up here, of sort of the very first versions of Uber's dynamic pricing screen, you know, the thing you saw in the app. And it was designed by yours truly. It was my very first experiment in HTML and JavaScript. And for all of you aspiring data scientists, do not let the first feature where you try a new programming language be something that you send to customers to tell them their Uber is really expensive, because it's a very stressful <laughs> experience. And you're almost for sure going to get it wrong. So. Basically, what I had done was I had a screen, and it was like a wall of text, right? This is like Uber's dynamic pricing feature. Like, you know, thank you for trying out our new feature. It was going to be success. Thank you for all your... It's just like, it looks like a terms and conditions page, and then you just hit like, okay. And you like miss the very key point in it, like your Uber is going to be 6x more expensive than it is normally. This was about three days before New Year's Eve, which is like Uber's biggest night of the year. So again, hindsight's 2020, right? Um, but <laughs> to be fair, I was given the job a week before New Year's. So like there's, um, but that, that, that gets in the way of telling a good story. Um, no, so, so the point being is that like an absolutely brilliant data science model designed by a brilliant data scientist wrapped in a crappy product experience is still a bad data science model, right? Like you kind of have to make sure you understand the business context of what you're working in, as in how are people going to be viewing the product? How do people think about this product? What are the sort of behavioral ticks that go into this? Like you can't just do data science in a vacuum. Um, 
And so I learned that lesson very painfully. Hopefully you guys are learning it less painfully by me just telling all the stories of me screwing it up. Um, by the end of data science, by the end of um, that project, I was basically managing. So I became Uber's first head of data science. Before that, we were called something like really cool, like computational engineers or something. But like it was data science, we just kind of predated the trend. Um, built organizations um, throughout Uber, so hired Uber's first hundred and some odd data scientists. Um, kind of spent, and then built like our, uh, my next big thing was building out their data science tooling. So a lot of you are probably familiar with some of these like data science, data workbench tools, you know, like things like Looker and Domino. Um, there's a whole variety of sort of workbenches. I was sort of responsible for building Uber's in-house version. Um, and that was fun, but they didn't really love selling products to my colleagues. Um, so I wanted to get back to like changing something outside the world, remember, quantitative intersect real world. Um, so I spent my last year at Uber building Uber Freight, um, which is a brand new product that's been growing like gangbusters. That's basically the, uh, the Uber approach, peer-to-peer -peer distributed rideshare network applied to long haul trucking. Right? So how do we connect uh, truckers who have uh, the ability to move freight with people who need stuff moved? Um, that went through September of 2016, and after six years, I was excited to take on a different kind of data problem. Um, so I did a quick gig as an EIR, which um, stands for Entrepreneur in Residence. It's basically a holding pattern. You help due diligence on companies for venture teams, think about Fadi Euro thing, and I actually just joined Tala in December. So all that blurb is all about three weeks of knowledge so far. So I'm doing pretty good of evangelizing the company if I do say so myself. And this is always fun. People always ask where did it start. I've literally went up and dug up the email. So I worked for Travis directly for about three years. Um, and a lot of people ask me what it's like in the like most politically correct and, and frankly accurate answer. It's like everything you've ever read about Travis Kalanick is like both good and bad is like verbatim true, pretty much. Like it all just sort of cumulatively is like, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> is that like regression towards the mean in some PR sense almost? You know, like, yeah, it all averages out to accurate, right? <laughs> um, so I've spent the last like five years of my career basically helping people answer this question of basically how do I become an awesome data scientist? Sometimes through like the recruiting sense, you know, re interviewing um, and reviewing resumes, um, but oftentimes through situations like this. Um, I got into academia. I actually went to, to graduate school um, because I wanted to be a professor one day. Like this is like, was actually my dream job. I like growing people. I like helping people figure stuff out. Um, I disliked everything else about academia, but I love teaching. So um, I'm extremely excited to help folks find their way in the data science world, whether it's uh, personally or sort of collectively. Um, I, actually, we are. There, I saw this. There are two, there are two data science professorships open um, to help groom the next generation. But top five most common misconceptions I've run into thus far. One is, do I need to know coding? Right? Do I know too much coding? Do I not know enough coding? Do I know the right coding? Right? Like coding is just this thing I just like get a big sense of anxiety from. And, and the thing I say is, is, yes, you do, in the sense that some semblance of coding is required. Right? How quantitative models and the sort of abstract mathematical world intersects the real world most efficiently both on the ingress and outgress is through technology. You could acquire more information at scale to make better decisions through technology. You could affect the world and sort of deliver your model outputs to the world most effectively at scale through technology. That means you kind of got to know the lingua franca of how to do that. You got to know coding. But at the same time, my metaphor of the moment is it's like a spoiler on the race car, right? Like you need it to do the job well, but it's not like what the guy sells you on, right? Like, look at this amazing spoiler. It's like, just kind of there, right? It's a means to an end. So when you think about this from the lens of like, how do I 
sell myself to a company? How do I sort of get started in this whole data science scheme? You're making a sales pitch, right? You're selling yourself in the value you add to a company. Like, you don't need to lead with I know coding or I don't know coding, right? Your most valuable skill set you're developing is right here in this room, the ability to take this sort of abstract business problem, turn it into some sort of quantitative system, work that system to get an answer, and then use that answer to change something about the business, right? Like, that workflow is incredibly valuable. The fact that, like, maybe you're great at coding or weak at coding is sort of like the secondary or third bullet point, right? So don't stress out about it too much. Study it, but don't freak out about it if you have some gaps. Secondly, my research does or doesn't matter, right? The fact that I was at a number one ranked nuclear physics program did not actually get me the job at Uber, right? Um, but the fact that you know research, that you have done research, your research experience is valuable in the sense that it tells people who are looking at your resume, who are interviewing you, that you're comfortable sort of faced with this unknown, unsolvable problem and making progress in it. Right? It's very easy for people to be faced with like, boy, this is a hard, maybe impossible problem, and they can just sort of talk themselves out of making any impact. Like if you do research, you're basically practicing the ability to answer unsolved questions. And essentially, that's most of what data science does every day. So in that sense, it's valuable. But you know, whether the pedigree or the number of publications or the lab you're part of matters, it kind of depends on the company you want to go for, right? Like rule of thumb, larger companies care more about pedigree than smaller companies. Smaller companies care more about hustle than bigger companies, right? Like if you could tell the story like my story of I ran out of money, I worked every department in uh, Michigan State to find a home for my work, was able to sort of land it safely. Like that carries a lot more weight for a smaller company because it tells me it tells them I'm good at sort of scrappy problem solving, much more so than saying I had a high pedigree department. I think if I were to go to work at like Microsoft or Facebook or Google, like that could be a little bit different. Um, but just something to think about. Let's see. Sorry, this keeps shutting off. Third bullet point. On your resume, single biggest complaint. Tell me what you've done, not what you know. Right? Every resume bullet point should start with a verb. I want to know basically not, oh, I know MC, MC really well, or you know, I studied neural nets a lot. Tell me, oh, I used MC, MC to change how this ride-sharing product works. Or I used neural nets to totally reinvent how people think about credit scoring, right? I'm curious about the impact and outcome, not the methodology, right? I assume if you're getting a degree from UC San Diego for a professor Wojtek, like you know the methodology. You wouldn't have been able to pass this class if you didn't. I'm more curious about what you used it for. Sort of related, be problem oriented, not method oriented. This is really hard for folks in academia because your entire curriculum is methodological. Right? We do like probabilistic methods, and then machine learning, and then Bayesian statistics. And it trains people to think about, because you think about your classes in terms of what did you like, what did you not like. And that sort of informs what kind of career or sort of specialty you want to get into. I don't have a Bayesian statistics team at Dalla. I don't have an MCMC team. Like I have a team that does marketing, or I have a team that does credit worthiness. And you might use Bayesian statistics or MCMC or you know, whatever your preferred method of choice is. So I just encourage you that when you start to think about the transition into the professional world, like try to find the business problem or business function or the type of problem you enjoy more. Um, it just sort of helps speed up the conversation and sort of get you thinking about the world from a frame of mind that's a little bit post-academia. Does that make sense? And finally, you don't have to have your career figured out, right? I'm not expecting you to come in on day one and be like, yep, this is exactly what my next 12 years are going to be like. In fact, if you do, you're almost guaranteed to be wrong, right? There's plenty of opportunity in the field, especially one as young as data science, where you just say, like, I have no idea. Frankly, I know what I like. I like big problems. I like working with people. I don't like working with people. Um, I wanted to have something that reports right to the CEO and is sort of super next-gen, 
I want to be the person who takes you know, Gmail version 42 and finds a way to make version 42.1 10x better and finds like an innovative feature nobody thought about, right? Like those are kind of things where it's just a statement of basically what brings you fulfillment and joy in your job. And especially these days where you're gonna have the ability to basically pick between you know, any one of three dozen job offers. Um, having the ability to just sort of say, is this gonna be fun and fulfilling is far more important than trying to figure out is this the exact right title or organizational structure for me. Okay. How are we doing on time, by the way? 35 minutes. Come on. Yeah. Yes, sir. So you're talking here about tell me what you've done, not what you know. Sure. This class with a set of analyses they've done on some public data. What other recommendations do you have for people who don't have graduate degrees that want to go work in data science in order to bolster that portfolio so that they can overcome any kind of hurdle that they can show what they've done? Sure. So the question was, I'm going to paraphrase it a bit, but say you're somebody who's coming out of a, a degree with a bachelor's degree and you're trying to figure out beyond your foreign, final portfolio, what are other ways you can sort of show me competency in data science, like fair summary? Um, yeah, great question. Um, totally not teed up, by the way. No. Uh, um, so I think there's a couple ways. One is, I think when it comes to internships, we're just finally like sort of as a collective getting to the point where we have a data science internship program. Like sort of, mo this is just not hyper data driven, just sort of gut feel driven. Um, and because the internship program is so young, people tend to be very choosy. So if you're trying to come out of this from the point of view of a, um, trying to get a data science internship, companies tend to skew towards um, trying to find people in their master's years or maybe late PhD years to find internships. So I don't actually recommend trying to hang all your hopes on like that one cherry data science internship. You're just coming at it from a little bit of a disadvantage you can't fight. Instead, I would actually try and get an internship which gives you exposure to some of the other workflows in this. If there's opportunities to do research over the summer, especially any kind of research which involves programming, um, uh, software engineering internships, um, even just basic entrepreneurial internships. I mean, I, there were data scientists I hired, um, some of them based on just, you're a great fit for Uber because you spent the last three summers driving for Uber, right? And you know the product, plus a little quantity of know-how means you're a really effective person. So if you can even just get exposure to the sort of problem domain you're excited by, um, um, I think that those are all going to give you a lot of points. Um, secondly, uh, don't be afraid, especially if you like going for startups or sort of earlier phase companies, like don't be afraid to just show off your own personal GitHub account. Work on side projects, things that you're fascinated by, interesting problems. Um, I had a, a, an entry level data scientist, had never done a um, graduate degree in their life, and they showed me a GitHub where they had like written um, computer graphics code to basically calculate the like chloroplast, the lines that you see at the bottom of a pool. You know what I'm talking about? Well, if you're at a pool, that there's sort of those weird like white lines that go across the bottom of a pool. It's actually just like a, a light refraction problem. And so they just said like, hey, this was interesting to me. It has no literal use, but I was able to calculate this program. Just show off what you built on the side. Um, somebody presented me a data-driven reason why Steph Curry is not the best NBA player in the world <laughs> once. Bold, I respect bold. Um, you know what, like it doesn't have to be this sort of per perfect, you know, perfectly manicured pedigree. Show creativity, show enthusiasm, and show the ability to sort of put that quantitative and, and sort of physical world together and you're, you know, 50% above most the average candidate. Okay, I wanted to get this up. 
you know what, I'm going to quit trying to open this. Basically, it was just a thank you slide. Brad will have my contact information if you want to get a hold of me afterwards. So I want to segue into about 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less of Q&A, um, just to leave some time at the end for anything that comes up. So how about the way we'll do this, because I got the mic, is uh, raise your hand, tell me your question, I'll repeat it into the mic, and then we'll go from there. Fair? Who wants first question? In the front, you're making it easy on me. Who reached out to me at Tala? Good question. Um, so Tala was a really interesting conversation to have. Basically, the, this conversation, which over time led to me joining them. Um, about 2015, 2014, um, I realized I kind of missed early stage companies. Right, right. Uber w w was and, and is um, a really special experience, and there are a lot of positive aspects of it. But I kind of missed that like phase of like ten people around the conference room table, just kind of figuring it out. Um, so the best way I could think of to get exposure to that was I started advising and investing in companies. Basically, you go to early stage founders, say your idea is super cool. I'd love to figure out a way to help. If you need capital, I'll be an investor. If you need advice, I'll be an advisor. And so Tala actually started out as an advising conversation about maybe a year, year and a half ago. And I was really intrigued by them because, again, they sort of checked this physical world, quantitative world intersection problem. So that's one thing. I really like problems which are sort of right about to go through their exponential growth phase. And I'm convinced Tala and sort of microfinance is too. Um, and so it was just sort of a company I was really intrigued by. I got to meet the executive team um, and, and really found like th that they were colleagues I respected. They were sort of right in that intersection of people for whom I thought I was being uh, value added, but also learning a ton. Like if you ever find people like that, like glue yourself to them, like they're the most valuable professional relationships you'll have. Um, and it was interesting in like late summer, I helped them write the job description for a chief data officer because they were like, hey, we want to go hire somebody. I was wrapping up at Uber, needed a break. Um, and so I said, well, I'll help you write the job rec, right? Be helpful. And then like four months later, they came back and were like, did you like write your biography kind of thing? Like, I, I don't know if it was conscious or subconscious, but the job rec was basically like my perfect job or the job I was really dreamed of. So after like three or four months, they talked me into it and, and I've been uh, loving it ever since. Any, in the back. Is there a relationship between human-computer interaction and data science? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the sort of case study I was talking about with the surge screen, um, that you know, the sort of poor user design, absolutely impacts your ability to do data science well. You, they're, they're, in many ways, they're intrinsically linked. Um, I think a good, there's a couple companies um, which have gone through phases where they kind of forgot this. I think that there's a tension in it. For example, um, Airbnb very early on, basically from day one, Airbnb has been like obnoxiously, disgustingly beautiful, right? Like they just have this like amazingly designed product. And so they would build these interfaces which are basically about they're trying to serve the business function of how do I connect somebody who needs a place to stay with like the best possible home for them? And they forgot to put like any analytics into the system whatsoever. So they have this like obnoxiously beautiful framework, which doesn't actually help them. Like, like they were actually fulfilling um, Airbnb bookings at any higher rate post redesign to pre redesign, despite them obsessing over the sort of HCI elements of it. Um, and so, you know, the, the moral of the story here is that if you don't have that interface thoughtfully designed, both in terms of how people use it, as well as sort of how you get any sort of input signal out of it, you can't do data well. If you have a great sort of data solution that's really thoughtfully designed, that's expressed super poorly, sort of going the other way through the interface, then it's not going to be valuable to the company either. So yeah, I think that there's definitely sort of a, a healthy push-pull there. Sure. Yeah, 
and that group and my group, the data science folks, were actually putting in a very large grant to do data-driven design education, sort of marry the design lab and the, the uh, data science institute, so that data-driven design will be an aspect of the, hopefully the data science education both for undergrad and graduate students. So bringing those two things together, you know, leveraging all of the, the constraints that we have. So it's like 10 professors, uh, uh, Beth Simon, uh, Scott Clemmer, myself, uh, Don Morgan, and uh, Okay Alpita, who should be one of the best members of this class. So bringing in this group of people that haven't worked together. There's an interesting specialization too that's sort of an offshoot of data visualization, which has to do with just sort of like data user interaction. Um, that it's always, I always hang out in those sort of product demos because they're always designing and showing off these like beautiful but quantitatively rigorous tools. Like that to me is, is one of my favorite sort of side hustles. Other question, in the middle. Oh, yeah. Is anybody from that group here like actually observing the class right now? So also if you've been frustrated using Jupyter Notebooks, like any of the design decisions in Jupyter Notebooks, uh, there's a group of folks here that are actually, they've been embedding themselves in my classes, watching how the students use Jupyter Notebooks to see if we can actually improve the design to improve the data science work in the Interesting. I didn't even know that. That's cool. Okay, I, I pointed to some, my man in the middle. Yeah, what's up? Is it possible to use the creditworthiness approach we're developing to do general behavioral analysis? Um, it's a good question. I think that, and one I honestly can't answer, my instinct says that you're going to run into um, something sort of fundamental in the credit product, which has to do with the fact that like, ethical, effective financial services should actually be leading to positive change in people's lives. Whether it's a situation where you apply for a loan and you didn't get the answer you wanted, and, and you know, we can give you like three points of constructive feedback around, hey, and maybe if you change X, Y, or Z, you know, you'll, you'll get closer to the answer you want. Or the behavior over time of you know, using responsible credit. I went from sort of one food stand to two food stands to a restaurant and sort of led to a very like conscious improvement in one's ability to earn. Um, and so you're always going to sort of get, you, you can't work around the effect that people are sort of using this problem with an ulterior, or using this product with an ulterior motive in mind, or oftentimes they are. I don't know if that gets in the way of behavioral analysis, but I certainly think it's the effect you'd have to pay attention to if you were trying to like analyze across a different dimension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was, I said computer science isn't the main part of data science. Um, what are the core aspects of this? Um, don't don't misconstrue what I said, and maybe I expressed it poorly. What what I was selling against is this notion that computer science is not the end all be all of data science, right? right? That you could be like amazing at every other requirement, but if you don't know computer science, you're dead in the water, right? Like I think people tend to just obsess over that. So I think computer science is one of maybe three or four really critical skill sets. So the ability to code is is one. The ability to solve quantitative problems that just have a fully developed quantitative uh, toolbox. So I understand probab probability in and out. I understand business statistics. I have a working understanding of machine learning and predictive modeling, and maybe like one sort of passion or side hustle, you know, exotic form of statistics, an advanced form of predictive modeling. Like some aspect of that, just quantitative skills is probably the second big requirement. Um, Third is the ability to communicate effectively. And what I mean by that is you spend most of your job in industry, especially working with people who aren't data scientists, right? You're sort of the data person on a cross-functional team or you're communicating your results out to people outside of the company. So you need to have the ability to develop both the techniques and sort of wisdom of when to apply them 
to communicate hard quantitative ideas in a really consumable way to people depending on their, their sometimes wildly very technical level. Like that's what I mean by communication, beyond the sort of basics like can I work well with others and deliver the right information. Um, communication and data science is like the storytelling aspect to it. Um, and then finally, you need to have the ability um, to wrap all of this up in some sort of basic product set, right? Like pick your problem domain of choice. Um, you need to have the ability to understand not just that the methods are gonna interact the product, but the product is gonna sort of interact with your methods. So I think a, a classic example that we always used to assess at Uber, for example, is it's impossible or almost impossible to run an A-B test on an Uber marketplace, right? Because every agent or person to use the parlance, the agent of the OR parlance, but every basically entity in the Uber market, whether it's a car or person, your behavior intersects everybody else. If you request a ride, then you take a car out of the system that might have been available for me 30 seconds later versus if you don't. So the way of putting it is that there are strong interaction effects between every user in the system. So you can't A-B test, right? Because any sample will just contaminate the other sample. So one of the questions we used to ask in the interview process is, that does, like, you can't A-B test, why not? Yeah, I just gave you the first half of the interview question, congratulations. Secondly, that doesn't mean that we don't have hypotheses that need testing. Can you ideate on ways we could potentially do some sort of more statistically robust experimentation method, right? And so you kind of have to like understand how the product works to get why that would be a challenging question, but also understand whether the product works to sort of suggest other ideas. So the ability to just sort of think outside the quantitative domain is sort of the fourth big requirement. Okay, then your question? Perfect. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So the question was, when it comes to communicating and data visualization, what do you think about first? Um, I think that the common wrong way to do it is you sort of optimize for like the shock and awe factor. And you know, like, I think the most like egregious fault in this is geospatial data. I think many companies are like selling me, have sold me, or we've been discussing building products which essentially amount to like, I can take geospatial information and show it on the map, right? And I say, cool, like, and then what are we gonna do with it? And we all kind of like look awkwardly at each other for like 15 minutes and we can't really think about it. So like, but, but it looks cool, right? And so the, the sales pitch fundamentally boils down to like, well, it's really cool looking, right? And I'm like, cool, I have a graph and I have a map in my lobby. Like, I don't need another product to do that for me kind of thing. So point being, when it comes to data visualization and communication, I usually start with like, what do I want the key takeaway to be? Right, just sort of like, like what's the point? Why am I showing this information? Why am I occupying you know, valuable minutes of my colleagues' time? And sometimes the conclusion is like, this actually doesn't need visual representation. Like I can just write it down. Um, but if there are times where like, okay, I need to show this through some sort of visual aid, I usually try and think of, the, okay, what is the most, time efficient way that I can deliver this result while minimizing the risk of misinterpretation, right? And so usually you have to say, okay, here's a graph that just sort of gives you the point. And in startups, they always joke that anything up and to the right is always like the thing you show, right? So find your up and to the right graph. And then think through like, all right, what are the three probably like either biggest questions I'm gonna get as soon as I show this graph, or what are the three things people might take away which are incorrect? and then just sort of add supplementary data against those. Does that make sense? Cool. In the back. How do I find the most interesting problems to solve? Oh, um, so the question, and what makes them interesting? Is that, sorry, I, <laughs> um, one of the, I find it comforting, other people find it depressing facts of this, is like, this is one of those questions where you're never gonna globally optimize, right? This happens all the time where like, like what's the right way to organize your data is another one of these that you just, sorry, but there's no right answer. So I've gotten in the habit of sort of picking um, the sort of least bad outcome. So it's less a question of what's the most interesting and more what's the least uninteresting to me. 
And the beautiful thing about doing investing and advising in, in, at this phase in your career where you've sort of got the ability to do the pick of the litter, um, you're going to be able to get a lot of options. So my recommendation for you whenever you run into these sort of impossible to answer in any finite amount of time problems is you pick an arbitrary time constraint. For me, I decided, um, I, I eventually came to the conclusion I wanted to get back into a role Doing, doing professional data science at a large company. I was kicking around the idea of founding. But as soon as I made that decision, I said, cool, I'm gonna sample the company space for three months, right? Or I think it was 10 weeks, I decided. It doesn't have to be that formalized, but I'm being formal so you get the point. And then just in 10 weeks, at the end of 10 weeks, I'm gonna pick the one that I find sort of least bad. And usually, I mean, I'm being you know, pedantic, but usually there are two or three really cool options. For me, interesting is a combination of um, it's sort of the combined optimization of, of something that I find personally fulfilling, and I've talked a little bit about sort of the things which, which just intrigue me on a sort of an emotional level. Um, the things which I think provide the sort of most positive externalities for society, right? Like it's very common for folks to take a data science career and trade bonds for a living or do financial services. And I, you know, those forms of financial services. And it's not a question of, like, I'm not casting aspersions on anybody, but for me, I just knew I wouldn't be fulfilled working in something that I didn't believe was sort of, you know, net marginally good for us collectively. Um, and then we'll optimize for those two while holding constant, you know, the sort of financial and societal obligation to have, like, you know, my bills are X, I need to make Y, Y needs to be greater than X if, you know, my wife's going to be happy, sort of thing. Uh, so um, that's kind of my process. And the nice thing about this, especially for people, even for you, is like this is not a high stakes gamble in many ways. You guys have this like beautiful, wonderful opportunity where you're. It's kind of like the the job seekers market, right? You can show up at a company, and after six weeks, you're like, boy, this totally sucks. I totally misread this. Like you can leave and find another job in 48 hours if you absolutely had to. Right, like recognize that that's a luxury that like not many people even in the history of our race, certainly the modern sort of job seeking market have had, right? Um, and so like don't stress out too much about it. Be thoughtful about it, try and make the best decision, but don't like wrap yourself around the axle about it. Yeah. Well, I'm an executive, so I attend the meetings where I yell at people who do the quantitative stuff. No, I'm teasing. Um, well, I'm actually not teasing, but that's not the point of your question. Um, <laughs> um, no, but a typical day in the life. I mean, the, um, I think the, the conclusion that I've come to, and all of my experience conditioned on startups, right? Like, I've, I've never worked at a company which was older than eight or nine years old, ever. Um, and, and so most of my... My style is that data scientists are most effective when you form a small unit of people, usually no more than three, who's embedded or working closely with a cross-functional team. And cross-functional is basically defined by, um, do you have everybody in the room such that like if the doors were locked, you could still make a, a business, uh, a decision that adds business value? Can you make like the right call? And do you not need anybody's help outside the room to decide whether you're, not, you're allowed to work on it? And the reason for that is, is one, there's a lot of stuff to do, and that organizational structure tends to lead to more rapid iteration, you know, so always good for startups. But more importantly, it gives the people, the data people who are embedded on the team, the opportunity to just sort of like nerd out and go deep on like one specific dimension of, of in, in my most, second most recent experience in like the Uber problem space. Um, and so, like, one example that comes to mind um, from Uber, I was working really closely, staff people on the team, and sort of pinch head as their manager, who was doing customer service at Uber, right? And the idea, the way customer service sort of works macro scale is, on one side of, of the problem, you have uh, customers who have issues, and they have tickets that come in, um, and those tickets have some sort of content, I, what, what the issue was. But usually you can make some fairly basic heuristic-based decisions around urgency and prioritization. So like, hey, my Uber was in an accident, needs a, a lot more rapid response than like, hey, I forgot my Ray-Bans in the back of you know, uh, my last Uber. Um, although maybe down here Ray-Bans are of equal crisis. Um, <laughs> um, 
And then you can make some decisions around like what language it's in, right? On the other side of the problem space, you've got customer service agents. Some of those customer service agents are AI chatbots, some of them are human beings. And so like the problem, so they said like, how do we do customer service really well, right? Like how do we provide high quality support in a timely manner at scale everywhere on the globe, 24-7, 365? And so the data team recognizes, and I sort of gave it away because I'm teeing it up, like this is a dispatching problem. It's the same problem of connecting riders to drivers. You've just got you know, somebody who, something that needs attention, people who can provide attention, how do I connect them on average in the most effective strategy possible? And so the team like just first starts and sits with the business owners and sort of receives that brain dump, thinks among themselves, and says, oh, this is a rooting problem. Usually next process is there's, I'm compressing this into like a day in the life. This is really like um, a couple sprints worth of work. Um, usually there's like a, a research and discovery process. For something hyper-academic, it's like a literature review. We just sort of look for, does anybody, has anybody published a method that might help us connect tickets to drivers? Um, other times it, it's some combination of sort of try it out. You know, I ginned up this sort of fake system which gives us three types of tickets and 12 agents. Um, and I'm just going to sort of test out a couple different methods or strategies thinking that whatever wins in that little mini game will, will ramp up. So you kind of do this like research and development process. The goal of that is you come by the end of R&D to some consensus of this is the best possible thing we can build conditioned on the resources we have and the amount of time we have to build it in. And then you go through an implementation phase. And for some folks who are especially technical, you know, you're sitting right there with the engineers and writing the Python next to them. Other times, this is sort of a handoff. It's kind of six to one, half dozen of the other. But data always comes in at the end and does some basic sanity checking around, first of all, did you build what we sort of agreed to build? Secondly, how do we roll this out in such a way that the question of did it work is like a statistically verifiable hypothesis and not this sort of like gut feel thing? So. Oftentimes, this can be an A-B test. This can be uh, a sort of diff and diff approach. But essentially, it's a hypothesis ver validation exercise. And so you sort of, I like to structure teams so that you get to like touch every phase of the process. I think it's more fun. And frankly, for folks who are sort of early on in their career, you get to have a sort of pretty broad exposure that could suggest a specialization later on. Um, but then you roll it out, right? Um, and you validate if hypothesis works, congratulations, start working on V2 or sort of the next, pro if it didn't work, what is the data telling us about what, what of our original hypothesis was wrong? Does that suggest other work? Or does it maybe suggest we put this problem down for a while? And so we, we've had this system called Bliss at Uber now for three or four years, which has just gone through four or five different iterations of just dispatching tickets to customers. Um, each with, with sort of, um, can, thankfully, can continually better results. One, one more quick thing. Uh, if you showed up late and the sign was closed, you'd probably be open for five more minutes, so do it now. Oh, generous. <laughs> <laughs> Couple more questions. Yeah, in the front. I'm sorry, I don't mean to like pick on this group. I'm just not seeing a lot of hands in the wings. So if you're, way, if you're asking a question of the wings, I need like a double hand wave, okay? Yeah, in the front, sorry. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Yep. Sure. So the question, the question is, given that I'd sort of stated, and, and we're picking up on an industry bias towards a, a graduate degree, master's PhD, um, and the comments I was having about internships, am I bit disadvantaged if I go after a bachelor's in data science? Fair? Um, no, I don't think so. In the sense that um, I think what I've said is factually accurate, but you should also recognize that like, you're the snapshot in time of a field which is rapidly changing. Like the, the time horizon for sort of meaningful changes around what constitutes adequate training for a data scientist are changing rapidly year by year. I don't envy the team that has to come up with like the curriculum 
for a degree in data science because expect the class requirements to change. And as you get like older and you're looking back and you're like, oh, you guys have it so easy. Back when I did data science coming out in the 2018, we had to do so much more than that, right? Rule of thumb is like as the infrastructure becomes more developed and user friendly as the sort of helper tools, the workflow tools, the Jupyter notebooks of the world become more developed and user friendly. Um, and as the need becomes greater, all that adds up to a situation where it's both easier to do data science and you're rapidly incentivized to get to market as quick as possible. Um, so I see all the trends pointing to a place where a bachelor's in data science is not disadvantaging you. If I'd been having this talk five years ago, four years ago, I probably would have given you a different answer. Um, but I would say for, you know, if you're relatively early in your career, e even if you're a senior now at this point, um, coming out of a high quality school like, like UC San Diego or something, um, I wouldn't feel like you're putting yourself at, at a significant dif disadvantage. I um, mean, certainly not even two or three years from now. Time for one more question. One more question, oh no. I promised I'd go from the wings. And I'll be around afterwards if you want to find me in a more informal setting. Yeah, what's going on? Mm. Sure. Right. So the question was basically, how do you go from correlation to causation, right? How do you, right? I mean, like, how do you justify it? Um, so there's, there's a couple answers. I mean, one is the first answer is it, is it's really hard to do this in an academically rigorous sort of you know, um, you know, like pure defensible way. Um, there are techniques you could do around causal hypothesis. Experimentation could be really useful here. Like, for example, if we go um, find a population of people we've never touched before and sort of differentially bias towards people of many languages versus one language and just sort of experiment with this in a situation where we actually know the underlying migration dynamics of the, of the marketplace, that'd be one way to validate the hypothesis that um, languages correlate with, with sort of socioeconomic status. So experimentation can be good. The much more pragmatic answer is um, correlation to causation is like wildly abused in the industry. I mean, that's kind of uncomforting. But the reason why it's abused is one, we're startups. Many startups make business decisions, not just data decisions in a probabilistic way. You just say like, eh, it's probably gonna work, we'll figure it out. And the reason you can do that is going back to what I was saying before, if you organize such a system where you can enable rapid iteration, it takes the risk out of making some of those jumps, right? So there are lots of times in real world data science where you're gonna make sort of statistical shortcuts or quantitative shortcuts that your statistics professors are gonna wince about. And the truth is that you're saying, all right, I, I developed the intuition, right? Part of this whole process is cultivating intuition where you know, more times than not I'm gonna be right, but it's also a less risky decision because if I'm wrong, I can roll it back in 24 hours and iterate three more times by the end of the week. Right, so there's sort of this, it's almost like this like MCMC approach, like I'll try that, didn't work, all right, go here, go here, go here. And so oftentimes when you're sort of in the heat of the moment, you could just sort of look at data, look at the correlations, say, all right, this is not a strict causal relationship. If we need to define this, if we need to learn more about this, here's the experiment we could run. If we're okay with this being a little hand wavy because you know it's not existential to our business, let's just sort of work on this premise and say, okay, here's how I'm gonna know if this correlation was wrong, right? You kinda of wanna look for like what your failure criteria are. So if we suddenly see our default rate go up, despite we go into a marketplace where everybody is sort of uniformly lingual, then we can say, holy cow, okay, the language you speak was clearly not the reason why people were not, were not paying or, or not repaying their loans. Um, that invalidates my original hypothesis. Let me jump back and fix that problem. That makes sense? I touched on a couple things there. I mean, one is, you know, that, that you can sort of make probabilistic decisions if you can iterate rapidly. Secondly, you can make, you can sort of abuse correlation versus causation if you have a strong understanding of 
what would invalidate your causal relationship. And so you're like, well, I might not know now, but I'll know in three months once I run this experiment or once I run this feature. Um, and the third is if you really have to do it, like experiment, if you really have to get a strict causal relationship, I recommend experimentation more than anything. Okay, that's all the time I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you.